To cap off Black History Month, we're going to talk about African Americans creating in some of our favorite genres, such as video games and comic books. So sit back and enjoy. American History Month, Black History Month, we are going to talk about some of, of our most inspiring black influences in entertainment. Okay. Sweet. Cool. I like that. Um, so, uh, I'll start off by saying when I was a kid, I never thought about these things like the people that made the cartoons, the people that made my favorite comic books. Uh, the voices behind our favorite cartoons. Right. I never thought about these until I went to a comic book convention and, you know, all of a sudden, like I think it was in the eighth grade, Jim Lee was an Asian guy. Uh, then you had Dwayne Turner, who was a black guy, and I never thought about these things because I thought of these people as I don't know gods. Uh -huh, like uh -huh. Chris Claremont had a, didn't have a color in my head. Marv Wolfman didn't have a color. Like they you know, and, for, and as a kid, that's fine. In fact, that's maybe encouraged. And you know, now oh, yeah. it should be we should all just be people. But for me, coming from the African American perspective. Like, I didn't have that many heroes to, like, look up to, like, in entertainment. And especially people, like, creating and doing cool things, right? So, so won't you tell me about some, uh, some comic book creators? We could talk about artists like Angel Medina, who did, inf like, the Infinity Watch. Or Dwayne Turner, who did Wolverine. And then both of them ended up in Spawn, who is an African-American character created by white guys <laughs> um, that makes sense and you had Reggie Hudlin who wrote uh, Black Panther who was also the president of BET and then you had Christopher Priest who did an amazing run on Black Panther but the one guy that I really really enjoyed that is an awesome writer that happens to be black or happened to be black is Dwayne McDuffie Dwayne McDuffie was yeah. an amazing comic book writer uh, started off on Doom Patrol for Marvel and then um, he went on to do Milestone do you guys know what Milestone comics are um, okay, Milestone Comics was kind of a part of DC, where DC was like, hey, can you create like an African-American character for us? And Dwayne McDuffie was like, his whole idea was, why? When was this? This was probably late 80s, early 90s. Okay. Um, that early? Yeah. It was okay. like 92, 93 when Milestone actually came oh, out. Oh, that's so, right, yeah. So the Milestone imprint, what he wanted to do was not have one African-American character, because... He's like, wait, Batman doesn't represent the entire white race. Why should one black character represent all of us? Mm -hmm. We're all different people, right? So he created characters like Static, which they yeah. ended up with his own cartoon, Static Shock, co-written by Dwayne McDuffie. Uh, Ion and Hardware. All these characters, Ion was kind of like a Superman-ish character. And he had his own line of comics, which eventually didn't sell and got canceled. Um, then he went on to do television. Like, seriously, Static Shock. Uh... And he, the guy, man, he produced, edited, and or wrote 61 out of the 90-something episodes of uh, Justice League Unlimited. Really? Yeah. Some of the that. best cartoons released. Like, not just superheroes, just cartoons. Amazing. After that stint, he went on to work for DC uh, with the Justice League. And that is my favorite Justice League story. Mm. The Injustice League. Okay. Where the bad guys kind of take over, you know, they have the whole... Um, Brought back the, um, where did the bad guys hang out in Super Friends? Oh, uh, the, uh, the, the Legion of Doom. The Legion of Doom. Which is called the, the, the Hall of Doom. The, 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 the Terror Drome. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's G.I. Yeah, Joe. I Can ask me about black comic book creators. Don't ask me about where the bad guys hang out in DC. <laughs> um, so after that, he went on to do like a little, he brought back the Milestone Universe, which with this book, When Worlds Collide, this is Ion versus Superman. Um, and after this, he did like a two-issue miniseries. Like I said, Static Shock, he was doing that. But sadly, he passed away in 2011. Mm -hmm. And now they have like awards given out in his name for like comic book creators and stuff. But the guy was amazing. That's like, amazing. I, And I met him a couple times. He was a really nice guy. Um, you know, there are others, but he's the one to me that stood out the most. Okay, okay. Well, um, what about what about in the video game industry? I know, I mean, that's your thing, right? <laughs> video games, so. Yeah, so this is a little bit tough. A lot of games are made in... Especially the games that I prefer, made in Japan and, and the big companies over here in the United States. There are black engineers, obviously, black programmers. 
Um, but there's just not that many. There are some guys that have made it through the system. They've produced a lot of really cool games. One of the guys' name is Morgan Gray. And he himself may not be very well known, but he's done a whole lot of games that we've played. He started out like, you know, as a tester in QA and Q&A for a bunch of various companies and stuff. I think he's at E8 or Chris Dynamics. One of those EA Montreal type things is where he's at um, right now. But like he's produced a ton of stuff or helped with a ton of stuff like uh, Bioshock 2, most of the new Tomb Raiders like Tomb Raiders Legend, uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider. Um, he did other games for like different companies like Capcom he did. He helped out with uh, the new Bionic Commando remake. Uh, he helped out with Resident Evil 5. Um, just, and he's gone from being a tester to a programmer, developer, to a producer, to an executive producer. Like, he's gone through the ranks. He's just been in the industry since 99. So that's cool that, you know, this guy's out here doing this stuff and it's behind the scenes of games that we play and who even knew? Uh, X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter and Dark Forces 2 and all of these other Star Wars games and stuff. He's behind, his names are in the credits of these things. So that's pretty cool. Uh, there's another guy who's pretty famous named Marcus Montgomery. And this guy, right now, he is one of the big wigs at Glue Mobile, so chances are you've played or seen a Glue Mobile game. But uh, the other thing that he's known for is this website. I think it's uh, we dev, we do game dev com. I'm probably getting that wrong. Uh, we are game devs com. That's what it okay, is. Okay, yeah. We are game devs, and this we are game devs com focuses on diversity and not not just African Americans, not black people, but like just everyone diversity in game programming. Um, so he's done a bunch of things too, and but probably the thing that you may have seen. Uh, do you remember when Mattel had um, they released a game developer Barbie? Yeah. Did you remember that? She had stuff that a typical developer, specifically a game developer, would have, which was cool. But she was only available in one color. So this guy's wife, um, her name is Lisette, I believe. She was like, she's known in the game industry. She's also a an accomplished programmer, developer, designer in the game industry as well. I, I think she's referred to as the Olivia Pope of black <laughs> game development, right? Well, so what? That's how it is. Which, that's terrible. That, that's the only person we have to aspire to is Olivia Pope, but whatever, that's fine. <laughs> um, so this guy was like, I'm going to change. This is on, he posted pictures of this on Twitter. I'm going to change this. So he like modified, well, he didn't modify. He switched out clothes and made things that were appropriate for a black game developer woman so this is a really cool guy who, who is <clears throat> higher up in the higher up in the league of game development has respect and wants like you know like like i have two daughters i want them to know that there's absolutely african-american gaming and programming and engineers out there that can do stuff there's a hashtag uh 28 days of black cosplay uh, which is fairly recently uh i believe the cosplayer who did it is uh Princess uh, mentality cosplay. Okay. Um, these are famous cosplayers that these are. These are cosplayers that are well known. And they're African American. And they are African American. So there are black cosplayers. And back in the day, or at least yeah, we talked know, about years ago, black we did... Tifa. In yeah. Our first episode. <laughs> and I was yes. like, no, she's still Tifa. No, she's I had that Tifa. argument. <laughs> <laughs> I would say she's still Tifa. So. It... I agree. I'm just being myself. I know you're being yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so. It, it was coming at a point where, you know, white people or guys aren't the only ones who can express themselves in what they love. It doesn't matter who you identified with, if they're black, white, Asian, so forth. Um, but these are cosplayers that kind of had a hard start. Um, and I, I, I think it's difficult for them. I can't speak because obviously. It's pretty white. Yeah, I'm pretty white. Um, but for them, they're coming at it of a love for interest. So you have uh, well-known cosplayers like um, Kiss a Frog cosplay, uh, which is actually a fairly... She's the one that does Sailor Mars. She does I've Sailor Mars. Pictures, yeah. um, I think her website is MissThickBitch.com. Uh, <laughs> she dresses up as Tiana and she'll go to events and she personifies them for kids because she wants uh, kids to know that there are princesses of color. Um, and that there are cosplayers of color, and she's pretty well known in being not only for the black community, a voice there, but for also the heavier set or people of all body to try shapes and sizes. Mm. Um, so she's very vocal in the community on having an acceptance level for that. And there's the 
probably most famous out of the female butt cosplayers is Maki Roll. Uh, so she does some risky shoots, but she's, um... So let's make sure to show them. <laughs> <laughs> so she's a DC native. So she's also fairly close to here. Um, she's one of the more well-known black cosplayers in the community. Okay. Oh, so speaking of Disney, um, <laughs> well, you mentioned Princess and the Frog. Right, right. And so my, my daughters do have Tiana. So. I, I have to talk about one of the, one of my favorite Disney artists who is still around, the guy's 82 years old, is Floyd Norman. So Floyd Norman, do you guys know what an in-betweener is? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's how he started out at Disney. Like back but in maybe the explain it. Oh, yeah. an in-betweener <laughs> is the guy that draws the panels in between the main pictures by the guy that's doing the actual art directing, right? Keyframes. Uh, yes. Yes. In between yeah. okay. keyframes. Yeah. So, thank you. Um, so that's how he started out doing like some of the just TV little shorts and stuff like that. But Disney really like Walt Disney, the Walt Disney. Really liked his art, so he was like, "Hey, do you want to work on this project with us?" Well, he so he quit school because he was going to art school in Chicago. He quit school to join them in what is now known as Sleeping Beauty. So he was one of the in betweeners in Sleeping Beauty, and then that went on to 101 Dalmatians until he he got his own character, uh, shirt not shirt con Snake, Jungle Book, Ka Ka. Thank you. So he animated Ka. And like Wikipedia. <laughs> you, you are the Disney Wikipedia. See, you are going to be able to help, man. You are a go-to Disney guy. All right. So the guy is amazing. Like, he still hand draws. Because now, at the age of 65, Disney makes you retire. Right? Mm -hmm. They're like, well, awesome. Here's a rocky chair, and here's your retirement plan. <laughs> but mess Floyd up your didn't good drawing hand. I mean, Floyd's one of the last artists. The guy trained under the nine old men. No, he's one of, yeah, he's one of the nine old men. So, I mean... His big Disney break was uh, Jungle Book, which was Walt Disney's final movie that he did before he passed away. So he didn't want to retire. So there's an awesome documentary. If you guys haven't seen it, it's called uh, Floyd Norman, A uh, Life in Animation. Yeah, I think that's what it is. But anyway, it's really good. Especially if you have a family, watch it with the kids, man. It's awesome because it talks about how he just doesn't give up. And eventually he went back into animation. Mm. So it's really good. So The Boondocks uh, by Aaron McGritter. Um, it is a very, it started out as a comic. It was very political. Uh, it very much talked about the black African-American like scene and how that relates to like, you know, a, not just life, but also how that works with the world and politics and things His like that. art style definitely inspired by a lot of anime. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. yeah. I mean, that's one of my go-tos. I, I swear, the first time I saw it was when I was in a, a university. I saw a guy wearing a t-shirt that with Riley on it. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't, I hadn't seen that character. I'm like, oh, that's cool. They made a Dragon Ball Z character. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you didn't pick up the Sunday like funnies and read it? Because no, I used the funny to go papers, in the funny papers and no, then boondocks yeah so so Aaron McGregor like he loves Japanese animation he loves you can tell in his art like, style. like mm -hmm. Wu-Tang of course who doesn't like Wu-Tang and so there's a lot of that influence who doesn't like Wu-Tang there's a lot, a lot of influence in the characters which are Grandpa and then the two little boys Huey and Riley um, there's those also a myriad of other characters it's like Uncle Ruckus Tom, Uncle Ruckus <laughs> um, yeah. Tom and these guys are um, they're voiced by <laughs> very famous uh, black people like the grandpa in Friday and a bunch of other names that we'll spit out later the father of the cartridge based video game system I don't like to call him that that's who he is this guy's name is Jerry Lawson um, he was an amazing engineer he was born in Queens New York um, his his parents had they always encouraged him to do more engineering type things with himself and so he's a lot self-taught with like electronics like he learned how to like fix TVs to make money when he was a kid um, he moved out to uh, California and that's where he was a part of the homebrew club there which the homebrew club may be familiar to you. Have you ever, you know a guy named Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak? No, who are they? Okay. Mm -hmm. These I think one of them made uh, MySpace. Isn't, aren't they immigrants? Yeah, they're immigrants, right? Um, so these immigrant <laughs> guys were in this homebrew club and a bunch of other like Silicon Valley people started in this homebrew club. And him and another guy named Ron Jones were the only black people in this homebrew club. And what it was, it was hobbyists back in like 75 and 76, just getting together, like yeah. doing designing and just like you know nerdy things like this so this guy Jerry Lawson was a really cool guy he got started with that um, he had his own company 
he uh, designed for the company called Fairchild the first cartridge-based video game system. And it's also the first video game system that had a microprocessor. Up until then, like the Ataris of the days and the Magnavox, they had integrated circuits and their games were built in. Mm. So this is the first game, this is the first system where you had interchangeable cartridges. So what was the system called? The Fairchild Channel F. Wow, Fins. never heard of that. That's cool. I, I didn't yeah. know any of that. Yes, yes, this, is, yeah. this predates the Atari? This predates, well, it came out... It, it's in along coincides. the same. It coincides. Like Atari had their system out, but like it was like Pong is built in. That's it. So it predates the twenty six hundred. But person. So okay. Okay. So he, he made like twenty six. Not him personally. Well, actually, kind of him personally. But there are twenty six games for the system. Um, the games were. I tweeted about this earlier. Like the FCC, like had because there had never been a microprocessor system and a interchangeable system before. The FCC had to approve each thing that he came uh. out with. So um, he passed in 2011, but like right before that, he was inducted into the International Game Developers Convention, like Hall of Fame. We've all been talking, Dan. Your specialty is toys. Are there any strong African American leads? You know, it, it, it's a hard question, right? Because <laughs> you're sitting right in front of Jazz. <laughs> <laughs> um, Move base too, man. The toy industry. At least in you know in in my experience, doesn't lend itself to knowing anything about the creators, right? I mean, there's like I don't know if do you remember um, Sunman from our from our childhood? It's a company called Olmec Toys that put out it was like He-Man of color. Um, no, with, no. And, and but they you know whereas like all the black people in He-Man just had brown yeah, painted human man faces yeah, right. um you know this the whole point of this line was to put out characters of different ethnicities with very with the you know distinctive features of those ethnicity <laughs> ethnicities other than that i mean you don't really know a lot about who is sculpting or or creating these toys the only people like that i can think of are like executives who are pushing the line, right? Mm -hmm. We, we, I mean, there are a so, few sculptors like the Four Horsemen or Bowen from like, but those are statues and right. But I mean, other than the Four Horsemen, I mean, can you name even a studio that sculpts toys? I can't. I mean, no, you're right. Like, it's not on the back of the box so, or anything. Yeah. Okay. So really, I mean, that that's something where, you know, it's kind of an industry wide lack of credit. I'd be very curious to know who is sculpting and creating these toys yeah. um you know and and whether there's there's any diversity to that community whatsoever That'd be interesting to know. so if any of our uh watchers know anything about that let us know okay. all right so so thank you all for having this discussion uh, hopefully we can get more african americans in engineering and in the creation process and let's do this again so that's just a small few of the African Americans doing great things in our respective industries. I know we've missed a ton. Please put them in the comments below. Let us know who they are. Please like, share, subscribe. Thank you very much. There was a picture of Storm when she was like half naked and the curves on her body. As a kid, I was like, Damn. The really attractive, <laughs> curvy African Oh, yeah. So, women. speaking of African American. <laughs> this got weird quickly. I know. I was like, damn it. Why do I always reveal too much about myself? Um. <laughs> to quote Frederick Douglass if there is no struggle, there is no progress.